Ports are the gift that keep on giving. There will always, always be some weird port out there to talk about, be it an old classic or an updated re-release of some piece of crap from the 90s. But occasionally, developers throw a curveball at you by porting a game to a system that, by rights, it shouldn't have appeared on at all. And that is what we are celebrating this week, the five most unexpected ports of all time. Should start. Should start soon. It's, it's, it's going to be. It's going to be good. Any uh, any minute now. Should should have started, but is it is it going to start soon or is? Pinball Dreams and its follow-up Pinball Fantasies dropped for the Amiga and DOS computers back in 1992, each game featuring four tables using realistic physics and designed with the limitations of real pinball machines at the time. Both games were also ported to some consoles, including the Super Nintendo and the Game Gear, but these weren't particularly good ports, and anyway, everyone was porting stuff to the SNES in the 90s. Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasy set the bar for pinball simulations, and every other developer was scrambling to top them. But time passed, bigger and better pinball games came out over the years, and Pinball Dreams faded from memory. Imagine my surprise when I saw these titles pop up on the PlayStation Network as PlayStation Minis, titles that are playable on the PlayStation 3, PlayStation Portable, and latterly, the PlayStation Vita. Both games have been given the Minis treatment and are almost 100% faithful to the original Amiga versions. The ball physics, the audio, everything about these ports is authentic and accurate, and it even lets you flip the orientation 90 degrees for when you're playing on the PSP or the Vita. It's not as useful on the PlayStation 3, mind. A game getting ported to a new system is obviously nothing special, nothing new. Games get ported all the time, but seeing something from the Amiga pop up in an unlikely place like this is a nice little novelty and a wonderful trip down memory lane. Resident Evil is a whore of a game franchise, and Capcom is its pimp. That's actually a really bad analogy, but these games have popped up in a number of places, from the Nintendo 64 to the Game Boy Color, although obviously that port was cancelled. But in 2002, GameCube owners were treated to an exclusive, fully-fledged remake of the original Resident Evil, along with a prequel, Resident Evil Zero, both featuring spectacular, award-winning graphics and adding new elements to the lore of the series. Rumours began to circulate that Resident Evil 2 and 3 might be GameCube bound too, getting the same high quality remake treatment as the first game. They were right. Well, they were half right, which means they were also half wrong, so, you know, basically they uh, were wrong. They, they, they were wrong. In January of 2003, fresh ports of Resident Evil 2 and 3 were released for the GameCube. These ports don't have the bells and whistles seen in the PC or Dreamcast ports, and were apparently ported straight from the PlayStation, which is immensely disappointing if you're, you know, me. But they were intact, and what's more, they looked great. A few months later, GameCube owners were treated to a brand new port of Resident Evil Code Veronica X, itself a port of the expanded and updated PlayStation 2 port of Code Veronica for the Dreamcast. Thanks to these re-releases, you can now play through almost the entire Resident Evil story from Zero right the way through to Resident Evil 4 entirely on the GameCube. And then you can stop. Don't play 5 or 6. Don't, don't play those games at all. Don't, don't do that to yourself, okay? I, I, I care about you too much to let you hurt yourself that way. Yep, it's another unexpected Capcom port. I don't think anyone in the world was anticipating Capcom would port their high-definition open-world zombie smack em up to a system only slightly more powerful than its predecessor, but they did, and it's surprisingly more enjoyable than the 360 version. A more cynical person might think this is just an excuse for us to reuse footage from an earlier episode, but that person would be wrong 
because it's a different experience from the constant crowd of zombies in the 360 version. It's fun. It's a fun, enjoyable experience. So there. If you'd like to go back and learn more about this port, you can watch our episode from just a few weeks ago because, wow, you'll be surprised. Ah, Dragon's Lair. Beautifully animated, appallingly designed, a wonderful, terrible relic of the 1980s. But because it came out in an era when most video games featured brightly coloured squares shooting lines at other differently coloured squares, it stood out, making it a popular hit in arcades around the globe. Dragon's Lair has been and continues to be ported to a ton of systems, which is the kind of thing that happens when you spend a small fortune on movie quality animation and then try to recoup your losses. These days, Dragon's Lair turning up on a system isn't as much a badge of honour as it is a numbing inevitability, so you might find yourself wondering what this game is doing on a list of unexpected ports. Well, Dragon's Lair for the Game Boy Color, again published by Capcom, giving them a 60% share of this particular episode, was unexpected because, well, no one was expecting it. Most of the 8 and 16-bit Dragon's Lair games were platform games, very loosely based on the arcade game, and one of these games even came out on the Game Boy in 1991. What's unexpected about the Game Boy Color version of Dragon's Lair is that it's actually Dragon's Lair, the arcade game, with the animation completely redrawn to suit the smaller screen size and reduced technical capabilities of Nintendo's 8-bit handheld. Once again, this is a game that we've covered on the show before, so do feel free to go back and learn all about this port, as well as discover my seething hatred for Dragon's Lair as a game. Or you can stick around here and find out what the most unexpected port of all time is. Know what I'd rather do. After 15 years, Double Fine, in tandem with our third-party production team, will be remastering your classic adventure game, Grim Fandango. <laughs> We're cheating a little bit here, because this one was only announced a handful of months ago at E3 2014, but wow, what an announcement. Cult classic Grim Fandango was originally developed by LucasArts, which was effectively shuttered as a developer in 2013 when Disney bought parent company Lucasfilm the previous year. Astoundingly, Grim Fandango's designer, Tim Schafer, seen here staring directly into the very core of your being, was able to snatch up the rights and, in cooperation with Sony, is now remastering the game for the PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, Windows, Linux and Mac. Blimey. And all for a game that sold poorly when it dropped back in 1998. No, really, the poor sales of Grim Fandango are largely responsible for the decline of the adventure game genre as a whole, so it's nothing short of amazing that, in the year of our lore 2014, Tim Schafer would want to dust it off, give it a fresh coat of paint, and then somebody at Sony would say, yeah, absolutely, that's a great idea. How unexpected is that? For all of those things to happen, for every single one of those little things that lead to another, that led to another, that to this game being announced. It's it's just amazing. Personally, I can't wait for this game to drop. We don't have a release date yet, but given Double Fine's usual development cycle, we can probably expect it to come out sometime around 2024. <laughs> uh, 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 joke. Um, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. What are you saying? You'll see. He's after STARS members. There's no escape!